in respect of whether to choose to ignore a breach or whether to terminate before performance is due, we need to consider several issues. If we ignore an anticipatory breach, we are essentially affirming the contract. The contract continues and the usual rules of breach of contract apply. This brings with it a particular risk, and that is the risk of an intervening event. In Avery and Bowden, a ship was contracted to pick up some cargo in Odessa. When the ship arrived early, the ship's captain was told that the cargo was not ready for loading and in fact that it would not be ready for loading on the date which had been agreed. At that point, the ship's owners could have terminated for anticipatory breach, but they did not and the ship remained in port waiting for the due date even though they had been told that the cargo would not be ready by the due date. In the intervening time the Crimean War broke out and this intervening event brought the contract to an end. Thus, had the ship's owners terminated for anticipatory breach, they would have been able to claim damages. However, since they ignored the breach and affirmed the contract, and since the intervening event brought the contract to an end, they were not able to claim for damages. Another point to be considered is where the contract is affirmed. That means where the contract continues. Damages are determined at the time of performance. This may have an impact on an innocent party's deliberations as to whether to ignore a breach or whether to terminate early. For instance, if the price of what has been contracted for is expected to rise, it might be worth ignoring the breach and then claiming higher damages at the time of performance. Lastly, when considering whether one should ignore a breach, one should also consider whether it is possible to render performance without assistance from the other party. This is what happened in White and Carter and McGregor. McGregor was a garage who had contracted with White and Carter to display McGregor's advertisements on litter bins and the contract was to run for several years. Before the display of advertisements was to commence, McGregor stated that they no longer wanted to run the advertisements on the bins. Of course, in this scenario, White and Carter could perform the contract, namely place the advertisements on the bins, without any assistance from McGregor. It was entirely within White and Carter's sphere of control to do that. And this is exactly what they did, and thus they were able to claim and recover the entire contract price. This is of course not possible where the other party's assistance is necessary in performing the contract. So for instance, if someone is hired to do some repair works at someone else's premises, well, they would need to be let into the premises. So in the, such a scenario, this would not be possible. But certainly where it is possible, it is something to be considered by the innocent party. In terms of terminating immediately, terminating before performance is due. A party who wishes to do that needs to consider the duty to mitigate. The duty to mitigate basically means that the innocent party must take steps to minimize their losses. So where an innocent party terminates immediately, they know the contract has come to an end. This usually means that they will suffer losses because they had relied on the contract, for instance, um, as happened in Taiheng Cotton Mill and Kamseng Knitting Factory. The sellers agreed to sell cloth and knitwear to the buyers. When this was not delivered, it was for the buyers 
to mitigate their losses. That means for them to try and source the cloth and the knit where elsewhere. If a party does not mitigate their losses, they may see their damages substantially reduced. Lastly, let us look at the issue of partial performance or defective performance. Normally, where the parties to a contract have fully performed their obligations, the contract is discharged. This means that the contract comes to an end. Where only one party has performed its obligations, only that party is discharged under the contract. The other party who has not yet performed their obligations fully is not discharged. Special rules apply where a party has only partially performed their obligations under a contract. The outcome very much depends on the facts. In Cutter and Powell, Powell had hired Cutter for a sea voyage from Jamaica to England. The contract between Cutter and Powell stated that Powell would pay Cutter a certain amount for his services, but only if the entire voyage was complete. In other words, Cutter had contracted to complete the entire voyage, otherwise he was not going to get paid. Unfortunately, seven weeks into a ten-week voyage, Cutter died. His widow tried to recover payment of at least those seven weeks where he did perform his duties as a seaman. The widow failed because the contract had made it clear that unless Cutter completed the voyage, there would be no payment. However, in Sumter and Hedges, the outcome was different. Sumter had agreed to build two houses for Hedges. He completed some of the work, but then ran out of money and was no longer able to build the houses. Effectively, Sumter abandoned the contract. He then tried to recover for the amount of time and money he had put in up to the point of abandoning the contract. The court held that in that case, Hedges did have to pay Sumter specifically for the materials that Sumter had used up to the point in time of abandonment. Where a contract is complete in the sense that performance has been rendered, but that performance is defective, again, different rules apply depending on the circumstances. In Honig and Isaacs, Honig was supposed to build a wardrobe and a bookshelf for Isaacs. The work was complete, but the bookshelf as well as the wardrobe were defective. Isaacs refused to pay Honig. The court held that Isaacs did have to pay Honig, however, Isaacs was able to deduct the amount it cost him to have the defective wardrobe and the defective bookshelf fixed by someone else. However, in Bolton and Mahadeva, the outcome was different. In that case, Bolton was supposed to have installed a heating system in Mr. Mahadeva's house. The heating system was not fit for purpose. When Mahadeva refused to pay, Bolton sued. The court held that Mr. Mahadeva did not owe Mr. Bolton anything because there had been no substantial performance at all. After all, the contract was for a heating system and whatever was installed by Bolton was not fit for purpose. So we can contrast this to Honig and Isaacs where the contract was for two pieces of furniture and although they were defective, there was substantial performance. Where a contract is divisible, for instance, where a contract goes on for a long period of time and partial payments are made along the way for partial performance, these problems do not arise, at least not in the same way. So for instance, if Mr. Cutter and Cutter and Powell had been paid on a weekly basis, he would have been able to keep that money that he earned for every week that he was on the ship, notwithstanding that he died after seven weeks of a ten-week trip. Let us summarize this lecture on breach of contract. 
Generally, breaches can occur in two circumstances, before performance is due or after performance is due. There are three types of breach after performance is due. Breach of a condition, breach of a warranty, or breach of an innominate term. There's one type of breach before performance is due. This is called anticipatory breach. And we also looked at the issue of partial and defective performance. Thank you for listening and thank you for your interest in this lecture.